I have been asked to be the spokesman for this Allied Expeditionary Force in saying a word of introduction to what you are about to see. It is a story of the Nazi defeat on the Western Front. So far as possible, the editors have made it an account of the really important men in this campaign. I mean the enlisted soldiers, sailors and airmen, that fought through every obstacle to victory. Of course, to tell the whole story would take years, but the theme would be the same. Teamwork wins wars. I mean teamwork among nations, services, and men. All the way down the line, from the GI and the Tommy to us brass hats. Our enemy in this campaign was strong, resourceful, and cunning. But he made a few mistakes. His greatest blunder was this. He thought he could break up our partnership. But we were welded together by fighting for one great cause. Into one great team. A team in which you were an indispensable and working member. That spirit of free people working, fighting, and living together in one great cause has served us well on the Western Front. It will likewise defeat that other great enemy of human freedom. Even now, in the far off Pacific, reeling under the blows delivered by our gallant comrades in arms. We in the field pray that that spirit of comradeship will persist forever among the free peoples of the United Nations. <laughs> living in love and hope, whose sense of future in the surrounding air, this testament is offered. Here you may look on the violent fragments of our age and the once thinness of the little thread that made us then the citizens of freedom. For dark was Europe and the face of man when this begins. The nation had gone mad and struck out everywhere the compass knew. The ebb tide of our honor fell away and left its wreckage on a hundred coasts. The German cast his fires about the globe. His strength, drawn from the smoking sour and roar, lay in our weakness. And at last his conquests smoldered behind the barriers of his arms. Along the channel where the sea strikes France stood the west wall of concrete stone and steel to mock the frail hopes of the petty free. Wounded, hard-pressed and wasted on our strength, almost like madmen then, we plan to breach the wall and smash the German spine. But where? We search the coast of Europe like fierce eagles. Between low flushing and deep harboured Cherbourg, our eyes sought out the place of the assault. Exits and tidal range marked shallow flushing off. Sand and the wind cancelled the Belgian coast. The North Seine beaches were too small and cliffs barred the approaches. Cotentin, too narrow. The Pas de Calais, heavily defended. It all resolved on Normandy, on Caen. The airplanes could land upon the carpet ground, the coast defences were more light, and tides had a good range, and men were safe from winds. So on five miles of still unbloodied sand, the fretful course of fate would be assailed by armoured nations. Now our people bent to the construction of a steel array and took the builder's hammer in their hands. It seemed almost as though the sun stood still till our free peoples, full of rage and power, heaved through the air the ponderous spear of war. This is our people's story, in their words. I suppose if the Battle of the North Atlantic hadn't gone right, things well, might have been considerable different. That was an ugly time for all of us, merchant ships, naval escort, air patrol. I guess I had my share of bad luck. I lost three ships and some good friends.
somewhere that when a seagull comes down on a patch of oil, its feathers stick together and it can't get off the water again. There must have been a lot of dead seagulls around the North Atlantic. Of course, we only saw it happening on the wall map. And yet it was, well, quite real. When I started there, those markers we used reminded me of toys out of some children's game. But soon they became new boats and ships carrying cargoes, food and supplies and weapons and men to use them. I remember coming over, the worst thing about the trip was you didn't know where you were going. Wherever it was, you'd be a stranger and nobody likes that. That ship was loaded from stem to stern with sad sex. Around the third day out, things got pally. Like the fella said, hell, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> the comic. Finally, we got to Liverpool. They had a band to play us in, an English army band full of chimes. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, they played. <laughs> to tell you the truth, it was pretty corny. But nobody said anything because, well, you know, it was a nice gesture. Funny thing, on the way over, you felt like you were the whole works. You couldn't help it. But then, all over the UK, you'd see things that made you begin to realize you were just part of a, a hell of a big proposition. All kinds of things. I was a pre-med student at Johns Hopkins in civilian life. Now I do know a little something about anatomy. And I say it is scientifically impossible for the human body to stand up to the training we receive. An absolute impossibility. Muscles and tendons and bone structure was not designed to withstand that battering. Don't ask me how it happens that we did stand up to it. I don't know. It has no scientific explanation. Listen to this, out of one of them army pamphlets. To a young man, soldiering in the army of today offers exceptional advantages and opportunities, such as physical training, foreign travel, sport, and many other facilities which are normally denied to those engaged in the majority of civilian occupations. The majority of occupations in civil life become monotonous, to say the least. But in the army, life is so varied that there is little or no prospect of a monotonous or irksome time. So men were girded for their highest hour. And while they learned the lethal arts of war, in small and secret rooms, the planners met to watch their work mature. Beyond our view, the German proud and confident stood calm in deep emplacements on the armored coast. The war was not yet one of men and blood. The weapons were the factories and the maps and voices speaking in the hidden night. Season by season, all our plans advanced and those few men on whom the mass of war rested with all its weight worked ceaselessly. I used to wonder whether the millions of people doing their various jobs realized they were part of it all, paving the way for the invasion. We kept bashing away at German targets, mostly steel and oil, the Ruhr, Hamburg, Battle of Berlin. Things were getting tougher every trip. More ground defenses, more night fighters, more crews not coming back. We got away early in the morning. Sometimes we'd see Lancasters coming back. A lot of times we'd stoke up the same targets they did. We beat up aircraft factories too. It was a deluxe service, day and night, 24 hours a day. 
You dropped agents over France. Must be awful to risk your neck and have to keep it secret. One-man submarines, torpedo boats, commandos. We used them all to bring back cups full of sand from the beaches for analysis. It had to be quick drying with a solid clay foundation. It would have to support 30-ton tanks. I must have photographed nearly every field in France. The real job, of course, was the core area, but I didn't know that, nor did Jerry. We dropped stuff to the Mackey, arms, ammunition, sabotage materials, and so on. Then went over ourselves and taught them how to use it. We built it to specification, but we had not the least idea of what kind of a gadget it was. The only name it had was Mulberry. It was vital to know all about the same bay and the tides. And we trained the men to negotiate those tides and landing craft. Wearing down German sea power in preparation for the day. A special study of the weather along the Normandy coast. Miles of wire netting for the beaches. 7,200 tons of petrol per day. With an underwater pipeline to carry it to France. A white star is the emblem of liberation. Triple inoculation for all personnel. New ships pouring from the stocks. Old ships adapted. Listening to the German radio output for fresh intelligence. That was just part of the pre-invasion work. By December 43, the plan itself was set and we took it to Tehran for final discussion. The three leaders approved the plan. Our Russian forces advancing from the east and invasion from the west. And then the date was set. I assumed command at Shafe with the best all-round team for which a man could ask. Some had already been working for months in England. Others I brought with me from the Mediterranean. We adopted first a master plan and then had to coordinate every last detail of the ground, sea, and airplanes. While this was going on, we led off with an air show designed to make the landing points as soft as possible, to batter the German communications, and to make certain we'd have control of the air. It was quite a show. Those airmen did a magnificent job. We had Polish, French, Czechs, all sorts in our outfit. They'd natter away in the mess about what they'd been up to. The only word you could ever make out was marshalling yards. Us bombardiers seemed to do nothing but look down on French bridges those days. We used to ask each other, have you cut any good bridges lately? Well, finally, there was only one whole railway bridge left over the same between Paris and the sea. Down in the late spring, through the wounded towns of England, moved the mass made by our patients. Two precious years of plans were put away. The offices were empty. All the maps were rolled up on the walls. What had been paper at last had come alive. Across the channel, aware of our resolve, with cold contempt, alerted Germans stood beside their guns and reinforcements rumbled from the Rhine. Their generals were prepared, their might was poised. They looked across the heaving sea and grinned. They would reap harvest of us on the beaches and even death himself would stand amazed. Yet faint across the groaning of the sea came the thin thunder of a mass of power. Drawn from the great free peoples of the earth, it gathered in the ancient ports of England to crowd upon the steel-encumbered ships. down to the ships. We'd done it plenty of times before, of course, on schemes and that kind of thing. They didn't tell us this was the big show. Might have been just another exercise. Some of the chaps cracked gags. They wasn't very comic, but we laughed. I think we all guessed. The general feeling was, OK, if this is it, let's get in there and get it over with. Waiting always got on my nerves. Even waiting for a bus, never could stand it. Well, after a bit, our ship found its place in the middle of all the rest of the stuff. And there we stayed for days.
They gave us the final briefing then. We knew what to do and how. And they told us where and when. That's a briefing. I listened to every word. Wrote it down in my head like a record and it kept playing over and over again. Piece of beach in the morning. Ever since I became a soldier, they were getting me ready for this. Before, there had been time in front of me, protecting me. Now the time had worn away and there were only a few hours left. In the morning, I'd have to face it. I tried to imagine how much fear I would have, you know, if it would keep me from doing my job. I suppose everybody else was wondering the same thing. Nobody said anything official, but all of a sudden the ship got much busier. And over the amplifier, the chaplain said he'd be saying mass at 18, 30 hours. Funny, I don't think I ever believed, even after the final briefing, that the invasion was going to come off. Then a voice in the loudspeaker said, men who wish to take their anti-seasick pills should take the first one now. That did it. a glider, the way we always practiced it, except that I'd never been in the air with a whole army before. Three airborne divisions, the 6th British, and 82nd, and 101st American. Just before the glider pilot cast off over the landing zone, I wished good luck over the radio. It seemed a sort of inadequate thing to say. As Supreme Commander, let me break in at this point to say just a word about the Navy. From the moment of embarkation to that of landing, the full burden fell upon the Navy and our merchant fleets. They had to sweep the mines, bombard the coastal batteries, marshal and protect the transports along the coastline preparatory to landing, and finally, man the small boats that carried the soldiers to the beach. On that day, there were more than 8,000 ships and landing craft on the shores of Normandy. It was a most intricate task and a vital one for the success of our plans. The courage, fidelity, and skill of the Royal and American Navies have no brighter page in their histories than that of June 6, 1944. <laughs>
London, only a few people knew. It was a well-kept secret. Around daybreak, we correspondents were called and told to be at the Ministry of Information at eight. Then they told us. called our beach Omaha. Don't ask me why. I've never been to Omaha, the one in Nebraska, I mean. It's anything like Omaha, France, you can have it. I understand Omaha was the roughest spot. We lost some good men, took a few prisoners. It was a lousy trade. We've been told what to expect, so it wasn't like a surprise or anything. It just, well, when it really happens, it's different. For a while there, we were pinned down, but a lucky thing, the other beaches were going better, so we got a little more than our share of the old teamwork. The Navy come in, the air guys, and finally we got moving good. Now you hear a lot about how long it takes to make battle-hardened soldiers out of green troops. Listen, I got to be a veteran in one day, that day. So they paved the beaches with their blood and lurched across the dunes and reached the roads. The German parried fiercely. In the depths of rich green pastured Normandy, the three airborne divisions, first of all to land, fought lion-like against most grievous odds. And loud across the cratered face of France came German reinforcements. From Berlin, a voice cried out the Allies must be hurled into the sea before another day had burned its hole in history. Locked in battle, the armies clashed. Our first objective then, was to merge all the beachheads into one and 50 miles of men drive on together beyond the red sands through the broken wall. Where I was, it wasn't too bad getting ashore. After that, it started. We had to fight for every bloody field. It was the same each time. Crawl on your belly, keeping your backside down like you'd been told. Chuck in a few hand grenades, then rush them. Sometimes they killed us, but we were killing more of them. The trickiest part was the farms. They were regular little jerry fortresses. If we couldn't manage them on our own, then we'd have to wait while the company commander called back for artillery support. The Navy was still with us too, chucking in shells ahead of us. In three days, we advanced seven miles. Then we were told to stand fast and dig in. Next morning, we heard the news. We got it from the BBC. It sounded great. We'd joined up all along the bridgehead. There was a solid line, 45 miles of it. We'd got a foothold. We were in. You didn't have to do much navigating to get there. You just followed the convoys. I was doing close support. We waited around and then the ground troops would whistle us out and told us about some hunt target they wanted removed and then in we go. We were like taxis on a cab ring. something nice about a beach, any beach. You think of a beach, and chances are you'll remember something nice, like a party or a picnic. Pals from the old days, girls in bathing suits. But the one I worked, Utah, looked more like a freight yard once we got going. For quite a while, we brought most supplies right over the open beach, like we'd practiced it and like we'd made up as we went along. We worked a 24-hour shift with ducks, lights, rafts, rowboats, all sorts of Rube Goldbergs. The stuff just kept pouring in. Tanks, trucks, food, ammo, guys, millions of things. We didn't think we'd spend 15 days in the same field outside Colin. With the wood behind us and the Germans in another wood half a mile in front of us. And a little empty valley in between. Each side mortaring each other all the time. Just men you had to live in a slit trench. He got into a routine. 
you know, stand through from half past four to half past five, and two hours wait for breakfast. Came up fairly hot. Tin bacon or sausage, tea, and of course, biscuits. We've been living on compo food since tea day. It's good food, but, well, you know, you got tired of it. I'd have given a lot for a slice of fresh bread and butter or a cup of fresh tea. Fifteen days is a long time to stay in one place and be mortared. You get so you think everyone's coming straight for you. case we ever had, especially the first one. The ambulance brought him in late one afternoon. I came over to where he was lying and he looked up and grinned. I asked him how he felt. He said something about the, the German with a machine pistol using him for a dartboard. He was quiet and patient and a little bewildered. He'd never been hurt before. He asked how the fighting was going and then he passed out. The doctor came over and looked at his wounds and then swore. Said he had no business to be alive. We put him on the operating table and did what we could. The doctor kept swearing all the time he was operating. We couldn't stop the bleeding. I remember the radio news that night. They said the casualties had been surprisingly light. thing was dear old Winston's idea. A collapsible prefabricated harbour with everything on it except a naffy. Well, I wouldn't put it past him. It's the sort of idea he would have. Hell of a gamble, but it worked in the end. Mulberry, they called it. Well, I felt pretty good about it because I'd watched it grow right from the sinking of the first ships for the out of breakwater. And further along to the west, the Yanks had brought one over too. Then on D plus uh, 13, I think it was, an onshore wind started up. Not much at first, but it got worse. Unloading onto the open beaches got very tricky. We heard that over on the Yank section, the other harbour had been put right out of action. And when the wind dropped, old Mulberry looked pretty sick. And up to that time, it was the only bleeding harbour we had. At the green tip of Normandy, the town of Cherbourg lay, a harbour for supplies. Our need for ports was vital as our breath. The German knew our lack and swiftly drew his forces into tight defensive groups so to contest the issue. All our plans turned upon Cherbourg. All our strategy waited upon its empty docks and piers. So the Americans sent all across Normandy to the coast, swung toward the north, impatient for the port. Through hedge and field they carved their heavy way. Remember back now when it seems like we took Cherbourg a couple of days after we hit the beach. Actually, it took 19 days to cover 30 miles. 30 miles and about 92,000 hedgerows and a battle at every hedgerow. Otherwise, it was nice country, like Connecticut. Pretty trees and orchards, lots of cows and nice little farmhouses. <laughs> the apples were too green to eat, I remember. We hit it all fine with the people, farmers, nice people. It got tough when we pulled up on the outskirts of Cherbourg. They had great defenses. And the artillery really carried the ball. For three days, we sucked it to them. Sometimes we were pouring in at point-blank range over open sights. Finally, old von Schlieben, the German commander, tossed in the sponge. That's after telling his men to fight to the dead. We took Cherbourg on June 25th. Everything was rosy except the harbor we come from. The Jerrys had really smeared that harbor. But right away, our guys went to work cleaning it up. And the way they tore into it, you could see that pretty soon it'd be waiting for us fine. Then, well, we fought our way up the peninsula. Now we'd have to fight our way out of it.
And everywhere inside France, we men of the Maquis were fighting too. I was in the north myself. We got telephone and telegraph and high tension lines, and eventually when the Allies landed, we fought in the open. In the Savoie Mountains, our friends held up German convoys. Well, it was a little easier in the mountains. Bosch reinforcements were delayed for many days. Factories and bridges would frequently disappear. But the price we paid for it was frightful. In the village of Oradour alone, the Germans slaughtered 1,100 out of the 1,200 population and the place was completely burned. They were accused to have ambushed German troops. Every house was destroyed. Women and children died in flames in the church where they had been locked. Yes, the price we paid was very great, but our job was done. Caen is a town through which the Easy On ripples its slow way to the waiting sea, capital of Normandy. And here the British struck a stone wall of Germans. This was no Cherbourg advance, a knife thrust through the fields, but rather was the grinding of a drill, inch by inch forward. Here it was the German feared a quick breakthrough to the River Seine, and here it was he massed his army's best, ten of the twelve divisions of his armor, paratroops, SS men, the young, the cruel, against the veterans of Alamein. We wanted him to fight here and to hold the battered ground because the future plans depended on him standing where he was. At Caen, the dust was diamonds. Every foot of ground was priceless, for by midmost summer, Caen was to be the pivot of the war. was the first decent-sized town we'd taken, but there wasn't any celebrations because we knew nothing had been settled. Jerry was as strong as ever. One of the men said, God, are we going to have to go right across the world doing this to beat him? Because most of Con was dust, just plain dust. I wondered what Hamilton back home in Canada would look like after a beating like that. Well, anyway, our tanks and the British started massing and moved south out of the city. We knew there was a big dew coming up. The show for us began south of Cone, where the Poles joined up with us. When we began moving forward, I heard a lot of the lads say, Rommel's on the run. <laughs> but I'd been at Alamein, I knew he wasn't on the run. And there was right. There was nothing lovely about the battle south of Cone. No pincer movements, no outflanking, no nothing like that. Just an hard, bitter, bloody slogging match. We had to stay there and give as good as we got, even if we couldn't give better. the rubble and the dust of Corps, the Empire troops kept up their endless pressure. The German did not dare to disengage, but fought with all his cunning and his strength, still unaware of what we planned for him. West by St. Lo, the base of his defense, Americans were poised and bent to fire an armored arrow that would set alight the flame of freedom through the whole of France. But till St. Lo was seized, the arrow waited. <laughs> 